Facing charges that could lead to a 10-year prison sentence, the computer hacker known as Electron appeared in court today in what is the first computer crime case to be tried in Australia. Tell me, in your own words, what fascination do you have with accessing computers overseas? It's not for any kind of personal gain or anything. It's just the kick of getting into a system. I mean, once you're in, you often get bored, and even though you still have access to the system, you may never call back. So I guess it's the challenge and the ego boost you get from doing something like that whereas other people try and fail. In the late 1980s, before there was public access to the internet, I was a computer hacker and I was part of a hacking group known as The Realm. Electron was born in an outer suburb of Melbourne. His father was a music teacher and his mother worked in a university. Mum was involved in computers. And I often wondered afterwards if that had anything to do with pushing me in that direction. I started writing computer programs with a pencil and paper when I was very young. I'd bought a book on basic computer programming which was aimed at kids. I think I wrote a primitive space invaders type program. My mother was very sick during this period. What time was that? And I remember the phone ringing, and while I couldn't hear the other end of the conversation, it was obvious that my mother had passed away. Mum's death had a huge impact on my father. He was pretty shattered by it, and I don't think he ever fully got over it. The school where my father was teaching music was reasonably progressive as far as getting computers into education went. And during the school holiday periods, when they didn't need them, he would bring one home and let me play with it. Wanting to know more about this world he had discovered, Electron bought his own computer when he was 16. At the same time, he read an article about how computer hackers had caused satellites to be moved in space. That motivated my wanting to get a modem. It was a 300 board, and it was $90 at the time. The modem was responsible for turning my interest in computers into an obsession. Using his modem, Electron could now connect to a world he'd only read about. He soon discovered that Melbourne was the capital of this international electronic community. It's hard to say exactly why hacking was centred in Melbourne in the 1980s, but I think some factors were the weather. You had a kind of backyard tinkerers culture. I think there may have also been the fact that Melbourne has long been seen as an intellectual capital in Australia um, and maybe in some way this fosters the intellectual curiosity that was such a common theme among the underground at that time. In the late 1980s the computer underground was a very friendly community. It was like an open-air bazaar. People didn't exchange money, they exchanged information. It was in many ways quite an innocent place where people would use handles instead of their real names to communicate online. 
They would take on a handle like force that would imply they were powerful in some way, or electron um, slipping under the net, or phoenix. They could excel within this community through technical prowess and receive accolades from their peers that they weren't getting elsewhere in their lives. Dad was in charge of the emergency teacher's stuff, so we had a kind of informal agreement that I'd keep the phone free in the mornings for the teachers to ring in sick, and he'd be able to organise an emergency. We'd have relatives ring up and say, we've been trying to get through for days. So we eventually told them to ring at the same time as the emergency teachers rang. All right. I was spending 18 hours a day, sometimes more, breaking into computers. All day, or as it normally was, all night. And it didn't make my father very happy when the phone bills came in. Right, so who's gonna pay for Just leave me alone! I'm confiscated! In the context of having quite a few arguments in the family situation, the keyboard and the screen don't argue. They do what you tell them to do. There were people who had difficulty and would be more comfortable in front of a keyboard than they would be in a social setting. You know, it's difficult for, for teenage boys anyway for so, all kinds of social reasons. And so the, the emergence of computing, which was this sort of supremely asocial world, uh, was, was you know, very comfortable for them. Before the movie War Games, hackers had been people who were around institutions like Stanford and MIT and were obsessed with big machines. It had nothing to do with breaking into computers. After the movie War Games, the term hacker came in the popular mind to be a teenage kid who spent his time breaking into computers. So it changed the meaning of the term hacker forever. I think War Games also created something of a model of behavior for kids who saw it as being cool to travel in these networks. War Games had a major impression on the psyche of the whole underground. It was the whole cloak and dagger thing, that there were security agencies and that type of thing involved. The first time I broke into NASA, I would have been 16, maybe 17. The feeling of exhilaration I felt was in direct proportion to the importance of the computer system that I was breaking into. So, yeah, breaking into NASA was very exhilarating. I felt it was an important step in my hacking career. As Electron continued to develop his hacking skills, he formed an online relationship with another rising star of the computer underground, a hacker known as Phoenix. When I first knew of Phoenix, he was a user of telephone calling cards, which allowed him to make free international calls. But the fact that he seemed to have a constant supply of these cards made him quite popular because he was able to download lots of pirated software from the US and to access all of their hacking sites. It was a relationship of convenience, really. Phoenix was just far too brash, and that brashness rubbed me up the wrong way. There were things that Phoenix wouldn't have got from me if I'd had the same modem speed that he did. Hackers couldn't access the internet just by dialing up the way you might today. So the only way they could get access at that point in time was to break into universities such as Melbourne University. Phoenix had got a Melbourne Uni account off someone else and he'd passed it on to me. And at that stage, I started using Melbourne Uni's computers to access computers on the internet. System administrators at Melbourne University regarded hackers as a nuisance and would trace their calls after first clipping the modem line. 
As the illegal logins persisted, the university notified the Australian Federal Police. Well, there was a guy who had an account at Melbourne Uni and I logged on to his machine anonymously and was having a chat to him. And he started talking about how Melbourne Uni had called in the Federal Police and Electron and Phoenix were involved in it. And it looks like there's going to be problems for them. I think initially we held conflicting views about whether the activities we were involved in were criminal or not. It was easy for us to think that this wasn't illegal and we weren't going to get into a lot of trouble. But on the other hand, it was, it was nice to think that, oh, well, maybe what we're doing is a bit naughty and, and perhaps a little bit illegal, and, and that makes it look a bit more romantic than it would otherwise. The 1980s was an interesting time to be growing up because there was the spectre of the Cold War during those years. And I can distinctly remember having nightmares about having nuclear missile silos in the backyard. My fellow Americans, thank you for sharing your time with me tonight. Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. There was a fatalism among some of the hackers, a sense that a nuclear war might start at any time. And as a result, it reduced a sense of consequences for their actions. I remember logging on anonymously one night and these people were saying the only reason Electron hasn't launched any nuclear missiles yet, he's got all the launch codes but they need to turn the key in the silo and that's why he's unable to launch them. It was bizarre. We had the United States Secret Service um, contact the Australian uh, Federal Police because they'd had problems with hackers getting into some of the American systems. They were convinced that the hackers came from Australia and uh, they were jumping up and down quite a bit to get us to do something. The referral from the United States was a bit of a bombshell because here was this referral of crimes committed on computers. And when you look at law enforcement at that time, not just Australia, but the world, no one had really looked at this sort of stuff before. It was brand new. My father knew what I was doing, but his attitude was that it was my problem and if I got caught, that it was bad luck. I think in some ways he saw computers as a positive thing and thought that if he's spending time on the computer, then that's an important skill. And that may have been partly why he was willing to turn a bit of a blind eye. I think the prime motivator was that they had a good time. I saw it also in terms of it was another Everest. It was there, so they climbed it. They were seen to be very clever, and they probably were very clever. No doubt about that. Very clever young people.
Well, there's the rush that you get from having broken in. There's also the feeling of control over the computer. It's almost like you're projected into the computer and you're able to operate things from this remote location. It was the remote access that I liked and the safety and anonymity of that. The realisation that I was addicted to hacking probably first came when I asked my father to hide the modem during exam times. It was the only way I was able to give myself any time to study. The first thing I normally did after studying for a couple of hours was start fossicking like a truffle pig looking for the modem. There was an online chat system in Germany which was referred to as Altos. It was a hothouse of some of the best hackers in the world. This was the probably most important community place where hackers from Germany, the US, Australia, around the globe would gather together to share information about sites that they'd hacked, um, accounts that they might be willing to share with each other in order to continue their hacking. On Altos, Electron formed an online friendship with a West German hacker known as Pengo, who was part of a group known as the Chaos Computer Club. What Electron didn't know was that Pengo and another hacker named Hagbard were selling information they had stolen from US military computers to the KGB. There were several meetings over a two-year period between the German hackers and KGB agents. Das ist Pengo, wie ich bereits erzählt habe. I don't think that Pengo's main motivation in this was some form of purposeful espionage. He actually said he just wanted to be the best hacker ever. Um, and to some degree, this also gave him access to bigger and better machines. I don't think he was interested in spying for the Russians, per se. Like all the changes that have swept East Germany recently, the beginning of the end for the Berlin Wall came much sooner than was expected. The sense of being in an international community on Altos was really highlighted during important world events. Speaking live online to Pengo in Germany at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall was quite an experience. It really gave you a feeling of a world without borders. It's an emotional moment for Germans. On Altos, the Australian hackers had a reputation as being among the best and the brightest. One reason this was true is because one of the Australian hackers, Force, had a program that was very valuable called DEFCON. DEFCON was designed to scan computer networks for addresses of computers on that network with modems attached. Force was at home alone one night running his famous DEF CON program and suddenly it connected to a system and he began receiving thousands of credit card numbers being dumped to his machine. When Force went through this giant data dump, he found in the last section some unusual credit card transactions. Some of them were for buying expensive cars or eating out at restaurants or even visiting brothels. And in fact, one of the people had a credit limit of $5 million. When Force checked the origin of the list, he found it came from one of the world's largest banks, Citibank. Force had a somewhat paternalistic attitude to other hackers in the computer underground in Melbourne, but his favorite protege was Phoenix, and he gave to Phoenix some of the credit card numbers from the Citibank machine. 
Not long after, Phoenix began breaking into other machines in the Citibank network. There was enough money involved for Citibank to get very edgy, very jumpy. There was enough money involved for them to contact the Secret Service and also the FBI. Most people back in 1988 were not stealing it to sell it. They were stealing it merely to prove that they could get to sensitive information. And the only way to get to the bottom of those things, because a lot of them were international and not US based, and a lot of them came out of Australia, was that you had to have a great working relationship with the Australian Federal Police. At that particular time, there was no law in Australia directly relating to computer crime. There was really very little the Federal Police could do other than take it on board as an intelligence probe to try and find out the facts and report to government that perhaps there was a problem with lack of legislation. The original file that, that came in complaining about this was made up and because we didn't have the people, we didn't have the expertise, we didn't have the knowledge, it was left and forgotten about. In the Northern Hemisphere, the West German police made headway in their own case when they arrested Pengo and his fellow hackers. Pengo gave full details of the hacking ring's activities in the hope of gaining immunity from prosecution. The German case made the Australian hackers very worried. It created a paranoia that they were next on the list. The Australians were made even more paranoid by the fact that one of the ringleaders of the German group, Hagbard, was found burned to death. His petrol doused charred remains were found in a forest in Germany. In January, two articles appeared in the Australian newspaper, one of them claiming that Australian hackers had stolen half a million dollars from Citibank. There were particular hackers named in these articles, including Electron and Phoenix. The Victorian police investigated the allegations and found them to be untrue. The articles that were published in The Australian indicated that there were a certain number of informants. It scared me for a couple of weeks. But then the fear versus the need to find the modem and start again won out. So I was back into it again pretty quickly. We probably had about 100 cases going over a two to three year period. And I'm not sure why, you can't explain why. Hackers were more prevalent attacking US systems, but at that particular point in time, they were. Uh, the situation, uh, Madam Speaker, is quite clear. Responding to increased pressure from U.S. authorities, the Australian government enacted the first... federal computer crime laws. The legislation specified stiff penalties ranging from hefty fines to 10 years imprisonment. The Australian Federal Police now had the authority to act. When the legislation came through, uh, I was asked to set up a computer crime unit using the existing people within the physical computer area and then bringing in other people who were investigators. The IFP had a very low computer literacy at that point in time. They we're talking about people still using typewriters. It's, it was still the carbon paper days. And so the unknown element of what computers were resulted in a very low opinion of people. They say, well, I don't use computers. It's not important. 
most of my other colleagues, most of my other people at my level, uh, thought it was a bit of a wank, and uh, that they, I should be out there investigating real crime. Initially, we had to borrow computers. We, we borrowed computers from banks, computers they didn't need, older ones. We had to borrow quite a bit of equipment from anybody we could speak nicely to at the time. From the investigator's point of view, it was a very steep learning curve. Most of us had computers, our own computer, but we would not have known what would happen if we lifted up the bonnet and had a look inside. OK, so what we've got here is a main cord going in. Make sure you remember... It's very difficult just trying to work out what all these brand-new terms were. I had a difficulty early in the piece of just understanding what is now, I suppose, the, the internet. How did it work? Who paid for it? Why could you get over to the United States and wouldn't cost you a penny? The new legislation sent shockwaves through the underground community. While many chose to lay low, one unknown hacker was about to focus the international spotlight on hacking. NASA was two days away from launching the space shuttle which carried the Galileo space probe. Galileo had been dogged by controversy from the very beginning because it was to be powered by plutonium. There was some concern that if the shuttle were to blow up, and this was the first shuttle flight after the Challenger, these plutonium power cells would rupture and that there would be a huge plutonium release into the state of Florida. So at that time, there was a protest going on around the launch, and it was effectively, I think, the morning of that launch that uh, this worm hit. NASA's computers had been attacked by a worm, a sophisticated form of computer virus. Can I speak to Ron Tenkati, please? The worm would change the system logon banner, so when the user would type in their password, up would pop this banner that would fill the screen, and it says, your computer has been wanked, you talk of times of peace and then prepare for war, and this logo that said, uh, worms against nuclear killers, W-A-N-K. Panic. <laughs> Just simple panic. Um, what happened initially was that there were a lot of phone calls going back and forth and a lot of confusion. There were different things you would see depending on what the worm was trying to do to your machine. It would say, hi, I'm deleting all your files, and start listing your files and saying, delete, 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 delete. As I began to read the code and understand some of the things that it could do, and started to diagram how it was working and stuff, it became clear to me that it was reasonable threat to the network. The mystery only deepened with the discovery of the process name attached to the worm, a collection of letters which formed the word oils. When I saw the word oils, I immediately knew it was the music band Midnight Oil. And so I began rummaging through my collection of Midnight Oil CDs looking for this lyric, you talk of times of peace for all, but then prepare for war. Talk of times of peace for all, and then prepare for war. For a writer and a journalist to kind of unearth where this came from to piece together the, you know, the solution to the mystery was extremely exciting. At the end of the day, the only things we know about the author of The Wank Worm is that he was probably Australian, he was certainly a Midnight Oil fan, and he may or may not have had some political agenda. In reality, the files were still there. They hadn't been moved, they hadn't been touched. But to the average user, uh, at least initially, they thought they'd lost all their work. 
On the one level, people can look at this as just one huge prank. And there's a lot of truth to that. However, that one huge prank cost me, my employer, my government, a lot of time, a lot of money, and it scared a lot of people needlessly. Did it ever stop a mission? Not to my knowledge. Am I still angry about it? Absolutely. Would I hunt him down if I had more data and I had the authority? No problem. Honestly, I still don't know who the authors of The Worm were. There were some rumors that it was the two chaps down in Australia, and I think years after The Worm was, was released, we've pretty much come to believe that it was Phoenix and Electron. No one has ever been connected as the creator of the wankworm. No one was ever charged. There was innuendo, an accusation, um, but in the end there was never enough evidence to actually go after particular hackers. While the US continued to exert pressure on the Australian authorities to deal with the hacking problem, Electron faced a more immediate crisis. My father was very dedicated to his teaching. When he found out that he had bowel cancer, I don't think it came as a huge surprise to him. He'd had symptoms of bleeding for a long time, but he wanted to finish the year. When he first told me that he had cancer, it seemed hard to believe. I can specifically remember thinking computers don't get cancer. If you've got a need to control your environment, a computer's definitely easier to interact with than other people. And the sense of control I got from interacting with the computer was certainly in stark contrast to the control I had over other events occurring at the time. Did you hack those vaxxers? No, I went to bed and hung up the phone. You? I got kicked off. Oh. During January 1990, both oh, Phoenix and I were on uni holidays and had a lot of spare time. The pattern was hack then talk, hack then talk, check in again, compare notes, and then back to hacking. We had information of their conversations through the telephone intercepts. Yet to prosecute, we had to get evidence on their computers. Early in the piece, we could not get that data. We could get their voices, fine, we could hear what they were saying. They'd say things like, uh, Electron, do you get that? And we would say frustratedly, you know, didn't say a bloody thing. Eventually, we managed to get their data as well. And that's from the, that's from the original motor. We could read the data in real time. That wasn't the problem. We could see it on our screens. But it was when we tried to record it and then play the recording back, all we initially got was a lot of hiss. At the same time, we've got other agencies from overseas and in Australia saying, do something, do something. And we're saying, well, we haven't got all the evidence together yet. While the federal police struggled to solve the problem of recording data, rumours of their investigation spread to the computer underground. Force had a meeting with Phoenix sometime after the legislation was passed and indicated that the federal police had a list and that Phoenix's and my name were on the top of it. Phoenix probably slowed down for a few days, but I'm not sure that I even broke stride. Force left the hacking scene completely and became involved in music. He didn't have the same addiction to hacking that I did. As they became more consumed with hacking, Electron and Phoenix sought more powerful hacking tools to break into more and more computers. The most powerful tool at the time was called Zardoz.
Zardoz was a newsletter that was regularly emailed to computer security professionals. It was a record of all the known computer security holes in operating systems, often with detailed instructions on how to exploit them. Zardoz was seen amongst the hacker community as the holy grail. In February 1990, after several hours of trying, Electron finally succeeded in breaking into a computer belonging to Australia's leading scientific research organisation, CSIRO, where he found a complete archive of Zardoz. The only thing that stopped me grabbing it there and then was my modem. It would have taken me hours to download it at 30 characters a second. Not wanting to risk losing such a valuable prize, Electron compressed the Zardoz archive and hid it in a temporary directory on the CSIRO machine. He then started to mail backup copies to accounts he'd hacked at Melbourne University. The university system administrator then warned his CSIRO colleague. prevented the mail from being delivered, the system administrator had failed to notice that Electron's original copy of Zardoz was still hidden on the CSIRO machine. The access details for the machine are mis1.csiro.au. The username's C Brown. The password is Geronimo. Thanks. See ya. I probably wouldn't have given Phoenix Zardoz if I didn't need him to download it. But his modem was eight times less risky for him to download it than it was for me. Phoenix decided to use the even faster connection from the University of Texas in order to retrieve the Zardoz file from the CSIRO computer. At one stage, he found that there wasn't enough drive space on the machine at the University of Texas. Oh, shit. I shudder to think what he deleted. Phoenix had a habit of indiscriminate deletion. Yes. Yep, we got it. Great. I'm still loading her in. It's a damn big file. <sighs> On the same day, the Australian Federal Police had their own breakthrough and finally managed to record the data coming from both the hackers' computers. The data intercepts had been done before, but at very low modem speeds. The problem was, how do you intercept the higher speeds? And the answer, like most other things, is simple, but somebody's got to have enough genius to figure out how to do it, which essentially they doubled the modem speed and were able to intercept it. You got to give the Australian Federal Police a lot of credit because the rest of the world didn't know how. Over a period of six weeks, we captured every keystroke that they made every word that they'd said. No, that's the wrong password file structure. You have to use FTP instead. Having Zardoz meant that almost every computer we accessed was up for grabs. I mean, we were already on a bit of a frenzy at this stage, but Zardoz put a few more drops of blood in the water. I did find what they're up to quite a concern, mainly because they were messing around in areas that they shouldn't have been. And it meant in many cases that the systems operators had to put up 
stronger firewalls. And I think at that stage, although maybe it didn't occur to me immediately, but it really was the start of the breakdown of the internet concept of openness. When you start out by hacking a number of universities and then you move up in the world to NASA, after that, what is there to do? The highest pinnacle is to break into the machines of the security experts. And that's what Eugene Spafford was. Spaff was very, very anti-hacker. Very lock him up and throw away the key. And we thought that he needed to be taken down a peg or two. Uh, I didn't set out to become uh, an enemy of that community, but I also believed it was important that we uh, start changing our behavior because computers were being used in more important places. Tell me what you're looking at. Phoenix and I talked through quite a lot of ways of getting into Spaff's machine, and eventually one of them worked. I'm in. There were a number of groups and individuals trying to break into my system, Phoenix being one of them. I didn't know what they were after, but kept the connection a little bit so that I could get an identification of where it was coming from, and then I disconnected the network. I'm a firm believer that one of the things that makes hacking so possible and so widespread is that the people doing that only see the computer and forget that on the other end there are people. Information about people, people who have their own dreams and who can be hurt by what's done. I originally uh, came into this with a pretty high opinion of these kids. I mean, I was fascinated with this culture. It was a subculture that uh, I really kind of identified with. I mean, you know, there is this sort of, there is this uh, spirit of adventure that is part and parcel of hacker culture. But what I saw over the next decade is a lot of malicious behavior. And I began, I began to realize that, you know, there were some spoiled brats out there that were doing real damage. John Markov reported that a worm had been coursing its way through various U.S. computer systems. In fact, what had happened is the Australians had been so active, had been breaking into so many machines in such a short period of time, that it looked like a worm, but in fact, it was people. Yes, John Markov, please. This is John Markov. Mr. Markov. I got a call from a young man who said he was from Australia, and he was very upset that he had been sort of confused with the machine, and he was also trying to uh, make the point that uh, he was upset with some of the computer security people who were at odds with the hacker community. Because I was able to confirm the attacks, uh, I ended up writing about it. The first article stated that they had no idea who we were or where we were from, and suddenly the next article spoke of hackers from Australia. I was horrified, but to be honest, I was a little bit chuffed about the New York Times showing some interest in this. I knew that this article wouldn't go unnoticed. It really felt like the beginning of the end. I just really need you to hide this.
And I'd just woken up with a full bladder and went to have a piss when the light goes off in the bathroom. And I thought, whoops, here we go. One thing the police didn't find was my modem. Dad had become so proficient at hiding it that even the Australian Federal Police couldn't find it. Number one I was involved in. They presented a lot of the evidence that they had from telephone intercepts and showed me logs of computers that had been broken into captures of the actual sessions occurring, asking if I was responsible for that. I put my hand up to pretty much everything they put in front of me. And I think a part of me recognised that morally I had broken the law and I needed to face the consequences. Now who gave you the passwords to access the other systems? Um, Phoenix. And who is Phoenix? I don't know his real name. After the arrest, I felt there was a hole left in my life and I needed to fill it. And I moved from one addiction to another. The three years leading up to the court case were pretty much of a blur, really. During this time, my father's condition deteriorated dramatically until he was finally admitted to hospital. My father died at an unfortunate time when we were not getting along very well. One of my regrets from that time is that I didn't reach a point where we were getting along well as adults. After my father passed away and before the sentencing, the stress and the pressure from the court case and the copious amounts of drugs I was taking led me to becoming more and more mentally unstable. And it eventually culminated in a complete breakdown, which required hospitalisation. I was facing 10 years in prison. It was probably touch and go as to whether I was going to come out of things at the other end. After a month of intensive treatment, I was able to return home. Though not fully recovered, I had to prepare myself for the upcoming court case. Because mine was the first computer crime case to be tried, I was worried about how severe the sentence might be. I was also concerned that they would want to send a strong message out to other hackers. Our society today is increasingly dependent on the use of computer technology. Conduct of the kind in which you engaged poses a threat to the usefulness of that technology. It is incumbent on the courts 
to see to it that the sentences they impose reflect the gravity of this kind of criminality. On each of counts 12, 13 and 14, you are convicted and are sentenced to terms of imprisonment of six months each to be concurrent. However, you will not be required to serve the terms of imprisonment imposed, provided you are of good behavior for the ensuing six months. Your conduct revealed arrogance on your part, open defiance, and an intention to beat the system. I have no doubt that certain sections of the community would regard anything other than a custodial sentence as less than appropriate. But after much reflection, I've concluded that an immediate term of imprisonment is unnecessary. There is traditionally always a conflict between law enforcement people that would say, oh, in this case I put in three years, all this work, and they got this sentence, it's not fair, it's not right. I would have personally thought, well, maybe they should have got more severe penalty. In 1998, five years after the sentencing, Ken Day and two other agents walked out of the AFP and into computer security jobs in the private sector. After 10 years of frustration, I had to leave. Computer crime in the AFP was a group of people in the corner of the building, shut the door, leave them alone. They really don't have much of a computer crime capability anymore. I think the fact that nobody's looking at the hacker community is a huge mistake because I think it's a gaping hole. You know, we're looking at things like nuclear reactors, we're looking at things like uh, the critical, critical infrastructure, water supply. There's another critical infrastructure. It's called computer networks. When I was arrested, I felt that law enforcement would be able to pretty much squash the computer hacking underground. But I hadn't really factored in the growth of the web and the amount of information sharing that that would enable. I mean, there's now the ability to download automated hacking tools from the web to do what it took us weeks or months to learn how to do. Hackers are a fact of life. They're not going to go away. They're always going to be with us, and no legislation is going to deter that. As soon as you have one group of hackers who have given up hacking, some other 15-year-old will rise up through the ranks and decide that he too wants to try and conquer the computer systems that put man on the moon. I think that initially there was perhaps misplaced fear for what these uh, largely kids could do, but that's changed. And in the last half year, as we've sort of mapped these giant computer systems and networks to our entire economic and social fabric, I don't think it's possible any longer to have too much fear. The amount of detail I share with current acquaintances and even friends about my past life is limited. I mean, there's situations where I outright lie about certain aspects of my past. How I would like to be remembered is very different from how Electron as a computer hacker will be remembered. I would much rather have been involved in building the infrastructure of the internet during that period rather than breaking into it.